So tonight we're going to be talking more about that discipleship, more about uh, the characteristic traits, and then we'll be moving into a different aspect of discipleship next time. Uh, we're going to be moving into the concerns of and the call to actually make disciples next time. So I am looking forward to continuing the study, but that's where we're going to be at tonight. So last two weeks, we have discussed so far that a disciple is one who loves to learn. It's one who puts Christ first, who lives a pure life, one who prays regularly, loves the word of God, and witnesses consistently. Now, uh, I said that really, really fast, so I'll say it again if you weren't here for one of those. But so what we've covered in the last two weeks are that a disciple is one who loves to learn, puts Christ first. It's one who lives a pure life. And we spoke about that for a little while, about how in our culture today, that's getting more and more difficult. Uh, it's one who prays regularly. That was one of my favorite ones so far that we've talked about, the need for us to be in prayer and to be in that communication with God. And it's not just a one-way communication where we just talk, but it's also having uh, that time where we just sit and we listen to what God uh, would like us to say. Or, or as scripture says, sometimes we just need to be still and know that he is God, that he is present, that he is in control, and that he is there. Uh, we talked about one who loves God's word. And so we started with he's a disciple is someone who loves to learn. And we talked about learning isn't just being in the word of God. It has a whole lot of different aspects. We learn from our teachers. We learn from our ministers. We learn from our shepherds. Growing up, one of the things, one of the ways I learned was I, I talk a lot about sitting with my grandpa, uh, watching football or going and working around the house or the property or something like that and learning a lot. But I also learned from just kind of being with people who were older in the congregation. Uh, we had an elder who lived just down the street in Arkansas from my grandparents. And I, I would go to Mr. Horn's house whenever I was over at my grandma's house. And uh, I would help him and his wife in the garden. And I, I learned a lot from that. And so we talked about a disciple is one who just loves to learn, not just about Jesus, but about the work of, the God, of God and how to accomplish that work. And, but the loving God's word it stems from that love to learn, but it's more geared towards the actual word of God. Because uh, as Christians, as disciples, as people who want to be like Christ, we, we have to know what that means. We have to know his teaching. We have to know how he responded to situations. Uh, we have to know what not just his teachings were and not just how to respond, but how we... Um, how we're to act, uh, not just in our interactions, but how we're to act when we come to God's presence and how we're to act when we come to the presence of non-Christians. How do we navigate obeying law versus when we disobey the law? How do we navigate when we listen to our employer versus when we disobey our employers? How do we navigate all these different things we have in life? So we need to be people who love the word of God and who regularly spend time in the word of God, because it's vital to our nourishment. And then finally, last week, we talked about a disciple is one who consistently witnesses, who consistently shares God, shares the good news of the kingdom of God with other people. And this is scattered all throughout the Bible. I, I used to think that it was primarily in the New Testament that this was a calling, because Matthew 28, Mark 16, Acts 2, uh, we, we see all these, even Acts 1, technically, we see all these different scriptures that talk about the mission of the church, but it's been the mission of the people of God since God chose Israel. In fact, God said that his goal was for his people to be a light to all the nations. Everything picked up on in the New Testament about us proclaiming and witnessing to the nations, if you will, all of that came out of something that had been in existence since Israel was chosen. In fact, part of the reason Christ came was ultimately, yes, to forgive our sins, but Israel wasn't doing its job in proclaiming. And, and so we were grafted in, and that became all of our responsibility uh, to do that. And so we talked about all that. And before we move into the concerns of a disciple and what it is to have a call of discipleship, 
before we go into that, we want to discuss three more characteristics of Jesus tonight, because I, I think, uh, sorry, of Jesus, they are characteristics of Jesus, but they're characteristics of a follower of Jesus. Let me correct myself. Now, as we have in all the other classes that we've done this way, if you want to uh, make a comment, if you have a question, anything like that, unmute yourself. Um, you may wait just a second to make sure you're not stepping on anyone. You can step on me, that's fine, but stepping on another commentator. Um, and then make sure once you're done, if you'll remute yourself, if you forget, not a problem, I can remute you. But uh, if you just unmute yourself, if you can't figure out how to unmute yourself, please uh, try to wave me down or uh, put in the chat box that you have a comment or something like that. And maybe Charlie can help me keep an eye on the chat box. Uh, and uh, Charlie can unmute his and yell at me saying someone wants to talk. But uh, so tonight, as we get into this tonight, we want to start out with just a very simple concept uh, of a characteristic trait. And that is something that I think we're all desperately longing for right now. It, it's something that we all desperately want and miss. And it's one of those you don't know what you have until you don't have it anymore. And that is a disciple is somebody who regular, regularly fellowships with other Christians. It's somebody who regularly has fellowship with other Christians. And this goes beyond just Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, or, or the basically the worship services and the Bible class mentality. Uh, a Christian is one who wants and, and desires that fellowship with others. And, and so here's my question, and I want to discuss this a few questions for a moment. The first question is, what does it mean to have regular fellowship with other Christians? What, so when you hear that, what, what do you see it meaning to have regular fellowship? What are examples maybe? Usually it takes a few minutes for people to warm up in here. Uh, give me a second, Coach, and I'll try to get you. There you go. You're unmuted, Coach. Well, hang out, go out to dinner, go to a movie, just be in each other's homes. Okay, so hang out, uh, go go to movies. You can't do any of that right now, but theoretically, well, you could, I guess, through Zoom. But uh, hang out, go to movies, be in each other's homes, uh, just go to eat together. Uh, that That's really good examples. And you see the early church doing that quite a bit. What else comes to mind? when you think of fellowship with each other beyond just worship and Bible class? Everyone's saying, man, coach took all the good answers. Oh, Brooke's got an answer. I can't hear you, Brooke. I got you unmuted. I got it, okay. Um. I think just regularly like allowing conversations about God to be in your your normal conversations with your friends. So I have a lot of, you know, Christian friends that I work with and God's just a regular part of our conversation just in our everyday life. Like even when we're at work and we're talking about, you know, work struggles a lot of times, you know, just he'll pop up in our conversation. So, you know, not like a formal thing, but it's just that's our regular speech with one another. Yeah, I think that's great. I think I saw Anita pop in. Yeah, uh, Lilani was saying that just maybe doing some uh, teen activities, uh, like if you're in the teen, if you have teens joining in and, and, you know, doing stuff with the teens. Okay, so if you, and that's really you know. great if you have the teens jumping in, joining them. And now are you talking <laughs> about parents? Yeah, parents joining in with the teens and, and like if they have some kind of activity, like not when the virus is going on, but when they have different <laughs> activities or, you know, stuff to do, uh, the parents join in and while the kids are out and the parents can fellowship with each other and, you know, stuff like that. Absolutely. I know I benefited from um, growing up in a church where we didn't really um, have the money to have a youth minister. But we had uh, two uh, deacons and a lot of parents who got heavily involved in the youth group. And it, it was amazing. Um, I remember a lot of stuff my dad did, even with the children's ministry and the youth group. Uh, it's just really helpful and beneficial. Um, I got you, Brooke. 
Oh, no. Okay. Never mind. I can't hear her, but she's saying, no, 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 no. Don't unmute me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought she was reaching for that mute button. Uh, any other thoughts about how we can fellowship as a body of believers? And we're obviously we're talking about mostly when we don't have this virus stuff going on, but even now, maybe. I saw somewhere that some people were doing a trivia night over Zoom. I thought that was a neat idea because they couldn't be in person together. So, uh, so there's a lot of different things when it comes to having regular fellowship with other Christians that we can look at, and it's vital, it's important. And so that brings to this, to the next question: Why is fellowship outside of worship and classes important for mm -hmm. the Christian? Ben, were you unmuting? I can't tell if he was unmuting or not. Why? Why is it? Um, why is it important for us to have fellowship? Feels just like we're sitting in the fellowship room here. <laughs> I think that, I mean, when you look at God, he's in fellowship. He's in fellowship with him and Christ and the Holy Spirit. So if God finds it essential enough for himself to be in fellowship, like we should want to be in fellowship as well. And we learn from each other and we grow from each other and we create bonds. And when we have difficult times in our lives, um, those are the people who are going to help us get through that. Um, because those are the ones who we have strong relationships with that are based off of our love for Christ together. Absolutely. I was going to say uh, that it's going to strengthen your relationship with one another. And also it brings encouragement for one another when you, you know, strengthen that relationship. Okay, so it strengthens that relationship and it uh, builds that encouragement. Anything yeah. else? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, Johnson family. Uh, <laughs> another reason why another reason why we should want to meet is because uh, it's a way that we can learn each other and find out what our needs are. Uh, we can't really meet each other's needs if we don't ever meet. It's also a way that I don't feel Christians do as much as we should, but to hold each other accountable. Um, if we know what's in our homes and what we're feeling and what we're doing, what our struggles are, and it's a way we can keep each other accountable. Yeah, and and along with that, there, there's you can open up a lot easier in a living room or around a kitchen table or dining room table than you're ever going to in a Bible class, right? And it's it's amazing what kind of not just fellowship but ministry can be done in a home any other thoughts hi charlie hi uh so one thing that that our group here said i guess was that it helps us to be christians on days besides just sunday and wednesdays um but i think additionally it helps us to be able to worship better together if we actually are connected to one another it's kind of hard to go into a room of strangers and be able to sing and pray and say i need this but it's the easier when it's people that you've done life with absolutely yeah, absolutely whenever you've done life with them when you've been involved in their family it's a lot easier not only easier but i think it's a lot more meaningful when you gather together to worship worship is directed towards god but worship is also a time in which we are encouraged. And it's a lot easier to be encouraged when we know each other. Now, I, I will say, when we go through the fellowship aspect of this, this doesn't mean that, you know, I've got a friend who works in a over 1,000 member congregation. There is no way he's going to be able to fellowship with every single member in that congregation. It's unrealistic. It's hard enough in a church of 200 people to do that. But we, we as Christians need to have, um, if you will, groupings in which we can fellowship together with, because it's vital. It's important into our lives. Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 42 through 47, it's a famous verse about fellowship. And 
I love it. I generally teach this because I, I like a lot of different things about it. One of the things I like is they devote them, themselves to teaching. So we already utilized this when we talked about the love of the word of God and the love of learning. But if we look at it again, they devoted themselves not just to the teaching, but to fellowshipping with each other. It says in verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So it's they devoted themselves not just to the teaching, but to the fellowship and, and the concept as you read through this passage, as well as when you read through the uh, next several chapters, if you will, of the book of Acts, you see it's not just to the fellowship, like the church, but to being together, to be present, to be in each other's homes. So it says they devoted themselves uh, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and of prayers. Verse 43, awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. But look at verse 44 here. And all who believed were together. Isn't that amazing? The believers, they wanted to be with each other. Uh, we live in a uh, suburban era where uh, everything went, um, it, it kind of went into the city historically and now it's kind of going back out and then at some point we'll see an upswing and in some areas you are seeing the upswing of city and then you'll see the outswing again later of living in the more um rural parts or the suburbs but what's interesting is the culture is different within the suburbs versus which it, within the inner city when you go into the city uh, generally, and again, broad strokes doesn't mean there's not exceptions to the rule, but generally within the inner city, it's a very communal uh, in that people want to be near each other. They're in each other's homes. Uh, and I say homes because most of the time it's little bitty Cracker Jack apartments and stuff like that. Whereas when you get in the suburbs, what happens? Now we have a lot more fences coming up. We have a whole lot more barriers between us and our neighbors. And um, it's not that we don't love people, but it, it's kind of interesting on how the two different areas view getting together and even what they do when they get together. As Christians, regardless of where we live, we're to be those who are together. All who believe were together in verse 44. They had all things in common. They were selling their possessions, it says, and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, so every day, attending the temple together, man, there's a lot of people who struggle with one time a week <laughs> getting together. And these people were every day. Now, I get that they were expecting Jesus to come back within the next month, right? A very short time. I understand that. But they were so much in love with the body of Christ that they wanted to be together, attended the temple together, breaking bread, and once again, we see it in their home, right? In their, here's one of the neat things about the coronavirus. Um, not that there's good with, about the virus, but good things have come from it as far as church goes anyway. I think this idea of fellowship together has been reinstilled in a lot of people's minds, and we have now started realizing how much we've missed it. But at the same time, I think we're now starting to realize that church doesn't happen in a centralized building. Church happens in the homes, in the streets, in the community. See, a building is simply a building. A church is the people of God wherever they gather. I, I, I mean, I, it's amazing because we, we got um, there's a lot of books that taught that were written in the 90s, the early 2000s, and even now that, that talked about the the centralization of church and the programization of church and how Christianity became all about programs and programs and programs in the church and that all of our fellowship centered around the church building. And a lot of the research showed this is helping to contribute it's not the it's not the reason behind it because that's a that's that would be a misinformation to say but it's contributing to the point of losing the mission of the church because it became all about centered around the building and the early church was centered not around a building but around homes and around the life 
of individuals. Now they met in large groupings, small groupings, and micro groupings, right? They, they met in, in the temples whenever they, or the temple courts, if you will, when they worship. Um, and then they met in larger gatherings. And then we see them meeting in little bitty gatherings as well. And so we see all of that take place, but I've enjoyed this, un, this renewal, if you will, not only where we long for that fellowship, but this renewal of realizing the church is not a building, it's all of us. And when we connect that with the disciple who fellowships regularly, we'll see amazing things happen because ministry begins to take place in the streets. And I say all that, there's nothing wrong with the building um, because they, they met in the temple courts. There's nothing wrong with ministries. We see ministries take place in the Bible. But the biggest ministries we say that change the world, it's you and I being together, doing things for God as we go about life as we go to our jobs, as we go into the community, as we walk into Walmart with our mask, staying six feet away from everybody possible, as we run out of the aisle when somebody sneezes. <laughs> um, I, I'm trying to bring some levity. That was a swing and a miss, but still. Um, they were in their each, each other's homes. Uh, this gets harder and harder. I've noticed it's kind of hard down here because some of the great distances people will travel uh fellowship has always been and the getting together has always been near and dear to my heart when you when we were living in upstate new york there's not nearly as many churches of christ and the churches of christ that exist are little bitty churches with the exception of a few i i know um i, I know uh a few of you you know coach and uh well basically uh everybody <laughs> related <laughs> to, to the McGrews. <laughs> knows um I, I think you guys know david owens right yeah so so they're nodding if you don't see them they know a, a preacher friend of mine named david owens who is uh preaching at and has been preaching for a long time at the wetzel road church of christ up in syracuse new york they are considered to be one of the big churches in new york churches of christ and they are like they are like the um mecca of church i, I mean they are looked at as being they've got it going on up there you know how huge they are i think they're still under like 180 people <laughs> but that's because most churches up there are 45 people and that's a big church i remember when we got to the in my first preaching position when we got over the 75 mark i remember thinking man we're a big church now in watertown new york and it's just so different um, they thought it was awesome because we got there and it was like 15 people and a year later we're at 75 people. They're like, man, we're a mega church. And I'm like, I came from the South guys. This isn't a mega church, but going up there because there's so few Christians, it really kind of reiterates the need to fellowship with each other. And I, I think that's something that I've brought back and I think is good for us to keep in mind and remember as well. Um, John 17 verse 23 says uh, that uh, I and them and you and me. And so Jesus is talking about some stuff. And then he says, I, I desire them to become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you love me. Now, I know there's a lot of context missing in this, but Jesus desires us to be perfectly one. And this doesn't mean we all have to think exactly the same. You can like pink and I can like blue and we'll still be brothers and sisters in Christ. What it's saying is that uni we're united in fellowship, that, that we are, uh, fellowship is being of the same purpose and mission and working together as we fulfill that purpose and mission. Um, it involves worshiping and learning and evangelizing, not just individually, but together as a community of believers. Um, the early disciples met and they did meet collectively in large gatherings, but they also met in homes. And in fact, they more often than not met in smaller groups rather than larger groups. And what I find interesting is the numbers that of conversions they had. And then whenever um, Christianity became legalized, um, I believe it was Constantine. It's been a long time since I've read that. Uh, you start seeing, a, you saw a real fast surge and then you see a sharp decline begin to take place. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, but I think 
as they got bigger buildings, historically you see this cycle where when we get bigger buildings and then whenever we move out of the urban environments into the uh, suburban environments, historically you see it in England as well in Europe, we tend to be less connected as a family of God. And so if you haven't figured out every night I choose one of the three and I spend a whole lot of time talking about it because it's near and dear to my heart. I try not to put all of those together in one night. So this is the one near and dear to my heart tonight. And that is just being together. Uh, it is certainly important on Sunday morning and Wednesdays um, when we meet together. But it's definitely important throughout life as well, outside of Bible class and worship services. Um, so the second thing that we want to talk about is... Uh, a disciple is one who not only uh, is one who regularly fellowships, but it's one who helps other people, one who helps other people. And this is certainly just as important as the other one. Uh, I, I, there's a lot of different ways. What are, what are some of the ways we can help people as Christians? What are some of those ways that we can help others? By through, you know, donations like our, you know, our church has the clothing drive and things like that. Um, I think, you know, way of helping others that are less fortunate. Okay. So donation of uh, things that are needed by those who are less fortunate. Maybe helping people figure out uh, how to get on Zoom. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but, uh, well, one, one thing we can do now is, while there's a lot of people who are nervous and worried about things, is call each other instead of waiting for the elders or the preacher or Absolutely. someone to call and check on each other. That's something we can do with each other. Um, don't just let the leaders of the church do it. That's, that's all of our responsibilities. Absolutely. Um, so we can help each other. And that brings up a good point that we don't know how to help if we're not told how to help right? And, and I'm not just talking about me and the elders. I'm talking about the church as a whole. Um, and it doesn't mean you have to come forward on a Sunday and share um, all the things going on. You certainly are welcome to do that if you're comfortable with that. But a lot of people are not comfortable just opening everything up in front of the entire congregation. And But sharing needs or sharing needs that you know of, maybe it's not your need, but someone else's need is vital. And so just pulling aside, and it doesn't even have to be me or one of the others, uh, pulling aside to each other, right? Um, and saying, hey, uh, I, I know some of you guys have been instrumental in getting jobs for people throughout the last seven years that I've been here. And it's not that most of the time they don't walk up front and say, I need a job. What it's been is someone found out. And so they know people who know people and they've helped line up jobs for individuals. That's a great way to help others. I, um, I saw, I, I love, several of you may know this guy. I know uh, Scott does, Scott and Sheila do, and I know the uh, uh, Carrillos do. But uh, I was talking to Steve Martin the other day, and uh, I, I told him, I said, man, you are just an inspiration to me. I, you, he has a Facebook page you, you need to follow. He is, I, I just see him helping people all the time. And it's just such an uplifting blessing to see him serve. And, and it reminds me of how I ought to serve. And we are all called to serve like that. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I just wanted to brag on him a little bit because I, I, I had a great time talking to him and it's, man, you know, I got to say this, uh, everybody being stuck at home, I've noticed, and I'm included in this because Katie's made comments about my uh, frequency of posting on Facebook now, but um, have you noticed everybody apparently now loves to post on Facebook and social media? It's like the thing to do, but um, that's because we have nowhere to go, and if we stay locked in with our children for much longer, we're going to go crazy, or it might just be me, but um, the uh, when it comes to Facebook, there's so many people they're offering help to others and you see them giving the help. But right now is a great time to reach out and ask what help is needed. Cause there, there's people that 
need some help out there. And with everything shut down for the most part, they're struggling to get some of that help. Um, what are other ways we can help others? Um, I think right now, like, especially um, if you know somebody who is older or immunocompromised who doesn't need to be getting mm -hmm. out, you know, or might not configure out the online pickup grocery order offering to go get their groceries and just drop them off at their front porch or pick up their medications or something like that so that they don't have to get out and risk them. Yeah. So pick up and then go drop off at their front porch. Um, kind of being a delivery service, if you will. And that's really helpful for, uh, I, I got a, we, we got help. We were, I told Katie, I said, uh, hey, do you mind um, going to the store on your way to work and seeing if there's any toilet paper? And so she went and, you know, because toilet paper is currency. Have you guys seen that uh, video on Facebook where the guy's paying bills with toilet paper sheets on it? I, I thought that was great. Um, but uh, anyway, she didn't have any at Kroger. And what's amazing is she walked into work and I don't know who it was, but somebody handed her a package of toilet paper. She didn't even ask. And I thought, what a great thing to do if you've got a surplus of toilet paper. Maybe, look, people are just happy to get a roll of toilet paper right now. Um, but there's a lot of different ways that we can reach out. The drop-off delivery type service is really helpful um, right now. Uh, getting, especially with groceries for those people too, I would um, say, because man, some of these stores you can't find anything in still. Uh, HEB is not like that right now, except for toilet paper and cleaning supplies. You can't get that anywhere. Um, so helping others, Ephesians 4 verse 28, uh, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor. I, I love this verse for a lot of reasons, but one, because it teaches that we're called to work. And two, it teaches us why we're called to work. It, it says, let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something. And then look at the key words there to share with anyone in need. We are called to work. Yes, we pay our bills. Yes, we need to have savings. Yes, we need to have retirement, all that. But we are called to work and receive so that we can share with others. It's been like this even in the Old Testament. Uh, Tiffany's cat is really getting into this lesson. <laughs> um, our work is not only for personal gain. It provides uh, us with means to help others who are in need. Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all of the house in the same way. Now, this talks about our works and what we do. So it's that idea of helping and serving others. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And, and so... Uh, it's not just, uh, and we'll get into money here in a few moments, but uh, we, we work so that we can help others. And we help others, not just so that we receive glory, but it's so that God receives glory. So how does the good work we do, how does that glorify God? How does it bring glory to God? I'm going to just start randomly unmuting people. <laughs> How does it glorify God whenever we do that? I think it, um, it just reminds people of God's love and that there are good loving people out there and, you know, that have a big heart and our hearts and stuff come from God. So it just, it's just a reminder of his love through, through us. Okay, yeah, so it's a reminder of his love through us and what we're doing. So it glorifies God because um, God, when God sees that we're there for each other, um, he, he, it, it's a way of him knowing that we care for one another. Okay, yeah, so it's a way for... Okay. Do it, you know, that's how we share love, when we're caring for one another. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One of my favorite illustrations is uh, the concept 
to talk about that we're an extension of God to this world. And it's the concept of a painting, a masterpiece that we, we look at. And when somebody sees a painting, uh, they, they don't look at that painting and they, they don't sit there and say, wow, what a great painting. The painting did such a good job creating itself. The painting is, right, when we're praising a painting, the painting did nothing. What we're actually doing is we're praising the artist who painted the piece of art, right? And so when we're looking at whatever painting styles you like, and we're admiring that, or we're admiring a photograph, the photograph or the painting did nothing itself. We're admiring the artist behind it. The, the truth is, we're simply a painting or a pho photograph. We're simply the one who points to the creator right? The, we point to the artist. And so when we do good work, when we do good things, when people see that work that we do, it's, it leads to glorifying God because we are simply the canvas and that's it. And I've always liked that illustration because it, it reminds us we are important, but God is more important. And our goal in, in what we do, our goal in helping others is to meet the needs of others because at the end of the day, it's not me that's important. It's the glory of God. And God wants us to be those who help because helping him brings others to acknowledge that he is a good God. He is a God who cares. He is a God who loves, a God who is concerned. Uh, Philippians 2, uh, verses 1 through 8. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but in verse uh, three, it says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count yourself, count others, I'm sorry, more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not to only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others, having this mind among yourselves. And then it talks about what mind is that? And that is the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ was a sacrificial mind, one that helped and served other people. And so as Christians, those who are Christ-like, we are called to be those who love to serve other people. Uh, we help others because we follow in the sacrificial footsteps of Jesus. It's not about us, but about following Christ and bringing glory to him. Uh, but a, a Christian is also not, not simply one who just regularly fellowships, not just one who helps others but a, a Christian is also one who honors God and specifically here honors God financially. Now, I, I bring this up because this is, you know, money it speaks loudly to not just God. It speaks loudly to us, right? Money means a lot. And what we do with our money is a window into our heart. It's a window into where we put our faith where we put our interest, where we put our emphasis in life. And, and so that's why money is one of, if not the, I can't remember if it's the top one or the second top, most talked about subject by Jesus. But it's not just by Jesus. The Old Testament has a ton to do with possession, not just money, but you know, it could be cows, it could be vegetables like uh, Cain and Abel's time. It could be a lot of different things. So. Money is important, and uh, a, a disciple is one who financially gives to God. Now, this is however great or small you can. It's, the, it's not that you have to give everything, but that you give something. Uh, Luke 21, 1 through 4, Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said to his disciples, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. Now, this isn't meaning go empty your bank accounts and give it to God. What Jesus is saying is, I, I think often we struggle in the United States, at least, with giving out of our abundance rather than giving sacrificially, giving out what we can spare rather than giving out what costs something, right? If I have a million dollars, and I don't, but if I have a million dollars and I give a hundred dollars to God, 
am I really giving to God? If I have a million dollars, a hundred dollars is like a penny, right? Um, and so, again, it's it's not a shaming concept as much as it's as Christians, as disciples, we need to ask. When I put my money places, it tells God something. So by my giving habits, what am I telling God? What am I telling God about my trust and who I trust in and what I trust in? What am I telling God about my desire and, and what I desire to do with my life and my money? Um, and, and by the way, I, it, it doesn't mean if you give 25% of your income to God, it doesn't mean that 25 of that income has to go to the church right? Uh, Katie and I give to a bunch of different things. We give to the church first, and then we give to other things outside of the church. Um, I've got a lot of friends who do the exact same thing. They give to their church first um, because that's their primary ministry, and uh, they see it as a responsibility for theirs, and that's where they have kind of hunkered down to do the work of God collectively. And then, however, they have other things that they support, um, whether it's uh, someone who's church planting or whether it's a, a ministry or a food uh, ministry or a clothing ministry, stuff like that. And so uh, financially, there's a lot of different ways to give to God. Uh, by the way, just as a plug for us, uh, we have made it easy where you can mail a check into the office or you can give online by going to liquidcoc.com and scrolling down and clicking the tab. You like that little plug I put in there? Um, but, uh, yeah, a Christian is one who gives to God of their finances, but, and they give regularly, they give regularly. Now, you know, uh, they don't just give sacrificially, they give regularly. Scripture doesn't ever, there is no command as to how often we are required to give to God. The only command we have is that we are called to regularly give to God and, and to give to God in a sacrificial nature. It doesn't mean give everything because God wants us to be smart about it too so that we need to pay our bills right pay your bills good Christians pay their bills when they can um, however um, you know we, we do it weekly some of us do it once a month we just give for the whole month monthly we take a collection up weekly because it, it's convenient right um, it helps with the budgeting process not just for the congregation but for us as individuals but um, we are called to re whatever regular looks like in your world. If we, we, Katie and I went for a time where we would just give all of our contribution once a month, just that, that was the very first thing we gave in the month. That way it was out of the way for the whole month. That sounds bad. What I mean is that way we knew that money set aside went to the church and there was no temptation to put it anywhere else. Uh, we've moved now to giving weekly. Um, sometimes it turns into bi-weekly depending on uh, what's going on. So there, it doesn't mean it has to be weekly, but it's that we give to God on a regular basis, whatever regular is going to look like, so that not just the church can uh, fulfill the mission of God, but so that you can as well. We're simply giving back to God what already belongs to him in that. Um, I, I had a bunch of questions about that, and honestly, I kind of answered all my questions about different ways we might do that and stuff. So I, I want to I summarize with this. Uh, I didn't go real deep into finances because I do several sermons about those a year, I feel like. So hopefully we've got a pretty good feeling. If not, you're more than welcome to reach out and uh, I can give you scriptures or frankly, you can Google and get scriptures. But uh, a disciple is one who regularly fellowships with other disciples, who serves and helps other people. And it's one who honors God financially. We honor God in a lot of ways, but finances is near and dear to the heart of God. And, and as disciples, as we do this, as we work uh, through this life, doing not just these three things, but everything we've talked about up to this point and everything we will talk about, it begins to shape us. It begins to form us. It, it begins to help us walk closer with Christ and to rely more on him and to understand who we are in him. And I personally believe it helps us to be better equipped as we work through this to help others become disciples of Jesus and grow as disciples of Jesus. So, so there's a lot of benefits from this, not just for the kingdom, but for you and I. Now, as I said the last two times, out of these three things, we all are working on something. This isn't a shaming 
this is a let's identify which one of these three we probably need to shear up individually this week and start thinking of ways we can shear that up so that we can start coming closer to what God has called us to do because guys we're, we're always growing I'm growing you're growing every time I preach every time I teach I find something in it that steps on my toe a little bit but hopefully my attempts at integrating those into my life are giving me traction so that as I disciple and make disciples I'm helping them follow Christ as I am following Christ uh, it's incremental changes it's just incremental changes. Little bitty changes make a big difference over a long period of time if you just keep one foot in front of the other moving forward to follow Christ. We're going to say a prayer, and then I'm going to unmute everybody, and you guys can talk, uh, hang out if you want, or you can get gone. I'm going to help put my kids to bed like normal. But let's go to God in prayer, and uh, then uh, I'll stay on. I'll keep mine running for a moment. If you have any other uh prayer requests that you would like me to pass on to Barbie, please put them in the box here. Father, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the opportunity, while not in person, the opportunity, though, to get together, even digitally. We're just so thankful for your love. We're so thankful for your grace. Help us to, every day, try to make strides to walk closer with you so that when someone looks at us, they do see a disciple. They do see someone who is a learner who follows in your son's footsteps and desperately tries to mimic a life after Christ. Father, help us to be so Christ-like that we're contagious, so Christ-like that people want to know what's different, so Christ-like that they are asking us what is different about us. Thank you for your son. Thank you for your love. Without your love, Christ never would have come. Without Christ's coming and sacrifice and resurrection, we would never have the opportunity of a new life. Father, be with all those who were mentioned in the prayer request. Be with us as we deal with this coronavirus and there's so much uncertainty in the world. Give us peace and help us to be ambassadors of peace in this time. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.